Their main pastime needs to be played. That's the healthiest, most important, most critical role of any mammal cub. This is how they learn. This is how they develop. They're hardwired to do it. And I know some people, when they hear this, they're like, well, not my child. My child doesn't know how to play. Or my child doesn't like to play. But the truth is that they are literally hardwired. It's in their neurobiology to do this. And it's a gift from Mother Nature because they learn so very much through play. And it's happening naturally and it's happening screen free and it's happening for free and without your involvement. So one of the beautiful things about this is that it's so beckoning to children. It's so in, in it really in, it, it's, it's enticing for them. It's, it's irresistible, in fact, when you really allow it, that you can get your cup of coffee and you can drink it while it's hot. You know, you can go and do that laundry, write, write those emails, have a Zoom meeting. Your children will be absorbed in a way that you never thought possible without a screen once you cater to these needs. Are you wanting to just be able to enjoy your morning beverage on your own for a few minutes while your kids actively engage in play or some other activity? If so, this podcast is for you. My friend Avital runs an incredible parenting and family platform and in addition has a background in design. She has literally mastered zones that you can create in your home, and she teaches you how on this podcast, that set you up for success and create an environment where your kids will actively engage and play on their own. It's insane. It may sound too good to be true, but it works. I promise. I've used her tools and they're incredible. My kids went from not being able to not be on screens in order for me to enjoy a minute with a hot beverage on my own to learning how to play on their own and keep themselves busy. And even better than that, they were presently engaged in play, which is really a kid's most important job. In addition to this, she's gonna share some thoughts and ideas on creating long-term goals for what you want your family values to be with your partner so that you can make day-to-day -day decisions that get you closer to what that vision truly looks like. Enjoy. I'm so glad to be here with my girl, Avital. Avital, thank you for joining me. Mel, it's amazing to be here together. Thank you for having me. So I talk a lot on this platform about the importance of surrounding ourselves with women uh, and obviously not just women, but women who elevate us, who stretch us to be better versions of ourselves, who allow us to show up authentically and vulnerably and in our truth. And a lot of times I'll say, if you don't have those people yet, just show up that way, like show up as you, whatever that looks like. And those people will come to you. And when I was living in New Jersey, that's how Avital showed up into my life. I was mm -hmm. at a soccer game watching, I think it was our middle son, Wyatt play soccer and up rolls Avital in her like freaking baby jogger with, I swear you had like four kids hanging off in like three bikes. <laughs> she had like, uh, Ta she, you had Tanya and Emmett. So they were what, probably like five and three. Yeah. Something like that. Uh, a bit this, smaller. Yeah. Even smaller. Yeah. Okay. And then you had a balance bike and yeah. a scooter probably. and then all these snacks that like, I could tell from the second you were opening them that they were aligned with how we raise our kids. And she was like, hi, I'm Avital. Who are you? And just like sat next to me. And I literally went home and I said to Jason, I pulled in a friend, like I had been struggling with where we were living with just connecting, um, with people that I needed in my life and you showed up and I'm so excited to share you with my listeners. Oh, Mel, that's such a, such a heartwarming way of, of telling the story. And I felt exactly the same way and it's not easy to, to make those connections. So that was a really special moment to just sit next to someone in a soccer game and then turn out to have such a deep connection. Mm -hmm. I feel like we just dove right in when you sat next to me. Uh, and I know that's what we'll do here too, but you literally, you were just like, it was like speed dating, getting to know you. Can we be friends? <laughs> <laughs> And our, <laughs> our topics of conversation was, I think you sat down, you literally, this is what I said to Jason when I got home, you were like, Hey, I'm Avital. I homeschool and you should too. But it wasn't like in a forceful way. That sounds like it was forceful, but it was like, it was what I was looking to do. And I'm like, great. Here she is. Here she is. Yeah. I remember you kind of whispering it to me like a joke, like I'm, I'm considering it, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh, jump right in. It's, it, it's awesome. <laughs> it was still a secret. It was like one of those big goals that I wanted and I didn't know how. And you were like, I'll tell you all the things I do. And those are the kind of women I like in my life. This is what I'm doing. This is how I do it. And you can do the exact same thing in your own way. So Mel, I've, I've got one for you, which is that 
um, my husband has been on me about fasting for, I don't know, five years up until the point that I met you. And I wouldn't even hear of it. Like I wouldn't even hear of it. I was like, no, I get hungry in the morning. I can't do this. It's going to make me dizzy. It's going to make me weak. You don't understand. You don't understand women. You don't understand me. I just wouldn't even like listen to the stuff he was telling me. And then within, I don't know, maybe that same day when I first met you, you were telling me how you teach about fasting and you teach about these workshops. And I was like, oh my gosh, one minute. If Mel does it, maybe I need to listen to this. <laughs> and it's since I, it's stuck ever since, you know, I've, I've been doing it ever since. And it's just been so amazing for me, but really it took your energy and your presence. And like, it, it had to come from you for whatever reason. I couldn't quite hear it before I met you. So it's amazing. These, these relationships open up new avenues. Right. It's, it's beautiful how we all fall into each other's world. If you're asking for it and looking for it and paying attention to it. Funny enough, you know, both of us at the time you were homeschooling and I was looking at getting into homeschooling and fast forward years later, you're in Israel, I'm in Miami, Florida, and all of our children are in school. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, along the way, I want to talk about all the things that you have taught me that have helped me in so many areas of my life. So Avitel is the founder of a platform called High Fam. She has five children. She is a go-getter, runs her business, and is probably one of the most present parents I've ever met in my life. And I know you're going to disagree because you're so humble, but sure. I have I literally, <laughs> I literally would come to your house and I'm so sad that I can't just fly across the pond and do that and sit there and just watch. And I'd watch how your house felt so calm and grounded and you have a system around it, which is what we're going to share. Um, because it made it very easy to replicate. And I would just like want to leave there and, you know, pull those ideas into our home. And I did, and it worked. And so I'm so thankful for the systems that you create um, and excited to share. And I want to start by saying, you know, something that was really interesting that I learned about you that I didn't know for a while was that you were originally a designer, a home designer. Is that what you um, I, I studied graphic design, but okay. Yeah, I come from a family where there's a lot of industrial design, fashion design, art, photography. So kind of a lot of a lot of thinking about aesthetics, visuals, design, function, form, that type of thing. Is that kind of what set you on this trajectory of creating uh, the zones that I referred to that I know we're going to go into in a little bit here. Yeah, absolutely. So just being trained in the world of design, no matter what kind of designer you are, you're always really looking at creativity as a way of solving a problem. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of one of the differentiators, the way I see it between, say, art and design is that art is really about expressing something, you know, it, it, you want to elicit some kind of emotion or thoughts within your viewer. Um, but design really has to solve some kind of problem. It has to work at the end of the day. Good design has to actually work. In other words, when you're doing graphic design, you have to be able to convey the message and it has to actually be received. It matters whether the person understands or doesn't understand what you're trying to do. And the same goes for, you know, fashion, for industrial design. You, you can design a beautiful chair, but if people can't sit in it, then you've basically failed. Um, as a designer, perhaps not as an artist, but as a designer. So yeah, I, I really love to look at realms that are outside of necessarily, you know, the visual aesthetic or particular designing particular forms or, or graphics, but really our whole life through a design lens, right? Like our relationships, um, our systems that we have in place, even our time management, you know, can we look at it uh, with that creativity of like, how can I solve this problem? How can I make it more beautiful, more efficient, simplify it, that type of thing. So it definitely comes from that world of design for sure. You created these zones in the home that make parenting so easy and well, easier, let's say easier. Yeah. Um, what I found when I just barely scratched the surface is that my kids started playing on their own. Our house felt more organized. It felt so easy and seamless. And each of these areas is by design. So I want to ask, what problem is it that you were solving when you came up with this idea? So I think one of the invisible problems that we experience very intensely as parents is that it's not easy to be at home with a child. Uh, children from the age of zero and all the way through to teens, they have a lot of needs and demands that come at you in a very constant way. And when you're within four walls that aren't necessarily catered to it, it can cause a lot of chaos and mayhem. They have sensory needs, they have psychological, emotional, social, academic, physical, fine motor, gross motor, all these different skills that they are 
really rearing to go. They're driven to develop them. And like all mammals, they're looking to play and explore and follow their curiosity and express themselves and do all sorts of things in a in a quite a rapid manner. And us adults, we've kind of trained ourselves out of all of that. We're, we're perfectly okay sitting still most of the day. Um, you know, we can contain messes. We uh, hopefully have some impulse control and delayed gratification. And we just don't treat our homes in the same way that a child does. There's a reason that we have this kind of image of a two-year-old as, as a little hurricane, as a little whirlwind, like clearing everything off the shelves and pulling themselves up and doing dangerous things. And the truth is that it, I just felt that when I was home alone with my little kids, which was often, it was incredibly stressful. And it might feel at the end of the day, like you've done nothing, but really you've been chasing your tail and trying to keep up and trying to keep some sense of semblance and order and answer their needs. And so that's really the problem that I was trying to solve was that there was a sense of chaos, which typically in our generation is answered with a screen. And I get that you know i understand why we've we all you know have that temptation and i think there's a time and a place for screens but like most parents out there i felt really rotten just having hours and hours of on end of my kids in front of a screen i knew it wasn't great for them on any level um but hey that's that's like that felt like the only solution to get the breather i need and so i felt like look this is a problem that that surely we can solve so you did can we dive right into a little bit of background on the zones and then perhaps a little bit about each zone. Yeah, awesome. When you look around your home, what you'll notice in, in almost any you know Western style home is that there are zones already that we call them rooms, right? Typically you have a kitchen, you have a bathroom, you have a living room, a, a bedroom. Um, even in a very tiny home, even if you're just living in one room, one room apartment, um, you're gonna have these, these different functionalities mapped out on that space. And that makes perfect sense because over the course of many hundreds of years, people have start to, started to really categorize what are the types of things that people need to do every day. They need to make food. They need to wash themselves. They need to use the bathroom. They need to sleep. They need to have sex. They need, there's all these different things that people do in the house. And furniture and you know structures were designed to support those needs and we take that for granted it's invisible to us because it's so part of the scenery we're just used to the fact that rooms in our home cater to what we're supposed to do when we walk into a kitchen you can tell by the materials there right by the fact that there is some kind of uh you know space for the cutlery for the pots and pans to light a fire to keep things cold a place for chopping all these kind of behaviors that are appropriate in a kitchen and you are actually getting subconscious messages that that's what you're supposed to do in this space and contrast that to the room just next door where there's a bathroom and it's completely inappropriate to say light a fire or you use knives but we couldn't switch around the behaviors that we do in these two rooms they're distinct and that keeps our life orderly and categorized and it makes sense, right? It makes it makes things easy. We know where to do what. And when you think about that basis, that architecture, that interior design that drives us, that actually teaches us how to behave, the environment is telling us what to do. Um, we don't actually apply that to little kids in our homes. Mm -hmm. When I go into clients' homes and I see the playroom, it's typically just going to be like a trunk of toys that is spilling over. There's going to be a place for all these toys, but they're often going to be cluttered and overwhelming and strewn out across the floor. And in many cases, there's going to be way more than is manageable, right? It's kind of akin to walking into a kitchen and having just dishes, dirty dishes all over this, all over the surface. And it's it's overwhelming and, it, and it's it's kind of repulsive. You, do, you don't even want to get go near. And so I noticed that we weren't utilizing those same principles of design when it comes to children we're just kind of stuffing it all in one place so the zones really takes what we've learned about rooms and starts to look at what is it that children need to do every day of course they need to do the same as us adults in the sense that they eat and sleep and, and use the toilet but they also need to play and that's really the main thing that children need to do when they're not at school when they're not asleep when they're not doing chores or sitting around the table and eating with their family their main pastime needs to be played. That's the healthiest, most important, most critical role of any mammal cub. This is how they learn. This is how they develop. They're hardwired to do it. And I know some people, when they hear this, they're like, well, not my child. My child doesn't know how to play. Or well, my child doesn't like to play. But the truth is that they are literally hardwired. It's in their neurobiology to do this. 
And it's a gift from Mother Nature because they learn so very much through play. They learn, they develop academic skills, they develop all of the skills that you basically want for them, the pro-social skills, the emotional, the vocabulary, the fine and gross motor. But there are different types of play. And so we do need to dis- d- distinguish between them and categorize and then cater to those needs. And then our homes actually become so much easier with little children in them. There's so much incredible information there. And you do such a good job of making it so succinct and clear. Can we talk about one of the zones? Let's start yeah, with the play zone. Okay, right. So the play zone, which I, I've been calling it the imagination zone. And I, I distinct distinguish this from other zones because there is a distinct need for children to step into imaginary roles it's really important for children to explore with identities dressing up uh, with manipulating characters or animals or vehicles dolls that type of thing and being the director in their own world right children are typically directed from morning till night Uh, told what to do. And this is the one area where they get to be in control. It's really healthy for children to imagine, uh, to express different things that they're concerned about or that they've seen. It's a place where they do a lot of emotional healing and and processing. And often a child will go through kind of, you know, it could be a, a real trauma or it could just be a mishap or something difficult that they went through, say a doctor's visit. And you'll see those themes play out in their play. So suddenly they'll do role reversal, for example, which is a classic psychodrama technique where rather than being the patient who was helpless and and, and felt, you know, put upon and intruded on, they become the doctor and they are treating their, their teddy bear, right? And often we just completely disregard this as adults. We don't even think of it as anything. It's like, oh, come for dinner. You're done now. Put that down. But when you start to become sensitive to what play is doing, you realize this is free therapy, man. I mean, this is, yeah. it's free therapy, right? But it's not just free therapy. It's free drama class. It's uh, vocabulary, speech development, you know, the ability to construct and uh, hold an idea together. Um, when children are building train tracks, you know, those are the building blocks, quite literally, of someone who's then able to direct a movie or write a novel or uh, become a civil engineer or or right or or do um uh, landscape architecture there are so many building blocks that are coming in there that are empowering them and it's happening naturally and it's happening screen free and it's happening for free and without your involvement so one of the beautiful things about this is that it's so beckoning to children it's so in in it really in, it, it's it's enticing for them it's, it's irresistible, in fact, when you really allow it, that you can get your cup of coffee and you can drink it while it's hot. You know, you can go and do that laundry, write, write those emails, have a Zoom meeting. Your children will be absorbed in a way that you never thought possible without a screen once you cater to these needs. Yep. And I remember literally witnessing that happening. So we talk about these zones and they're basically the areas throughout the home and they can they can be almost in like one big one area. You can put Absolutely. them all in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and many of mine were actually. And mm-hmm. one of the things that you taught me is to strew. And mm-hmm. so in the morning when I would get up before the kids, I would strew. And what strew means is setting something out that's, you taught me this, so correct me if I say anything wrong. You set something out that's an invitation for play. So, you know, going off the train track, I would set up part of a train track, maybe going up um, onto our fireplace and like a little toy elephant walking up it. And then I would set the, set the rest of the animals below it to kind of be like, here, what do you want to do with this? Mm-hmm. And I didn't realize, like, it's like, I wanted to believe that it would work because I so desperately wanted that time. You know, it's like when you become a mom and you have these little kids, I, I think more from, you know, toddler age on where they're active, like the baby stage was almost easier for me. I could just hold the baby and like sip my coffee and breastfeed and But when they're active, it's like, I needed to do something with them. I couldn't just sit and nourish myself. And I literally sat there and they walked down the stairs. The boys walked down the stairs and just instantly got in their own little world and were so happy and engaged. And I felt so good because I had that time. And I was also like, look what I just did. Look what Mm -hmm. I did. I didn't have to give them the iPad because I just needed that time to connect with myself. Mm -hmm. Um, So, so good. And there's right. there's how many different zones? There's four more. So we've done one. Four there more. are five. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You want us to speed through? 
yeah, let's do the next one. Great. So we have the messy zone. And this is one that a lot of people really hate because no one likes to deal with mess. It's really stressful. Um, but the truth is that sensory exploration and art- artistic expression are really, really good for kids. And they really keep them busy for a long time. And it's really worth the mess. But it's not worth the mess is that if that's overwhelming to you and if that's going to cause you to yell and get resentful. Mm-hmm. So the point of the messy zone is to allow that type of exploration, whether it's kinetic sand or paint or Play-Doh or anything that's likely to make a mess. Um, but doing so in a contained way and a boundaried way, right? I'm I'm big on boundaries. I'm big on rules. I don't think kids should have a free for all or, or just run amok. I think we need to create these containers and then allow freedom within them. So I think the messy zone is about making, whether it's a table or a tray, or even if it's a mat on the floor, or one of my favorites is just doing it inside the bathtub, literally. So everyone just gets hosed down at the end, especially with little kids. That's a really fun thing. Um, But the idea is basically contain the mess somehow. You could do it outside if you have access to the outside, but allow your kids to have sensory exploration. It's really good for their emotional regulation. Uh, If you have kids who are acting out, who are experiencing anxiety, who have explosive tantrums, explore with different areas of play. There's a reason that play therapy is such a popular uh, mode of, of therapy. You can use a lot of those principles in your own home. So even just allowing your children to explore with messy materials is something that is worth overcoming um, and 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 finding the way to allow it in your home, basically. Okay, perfect. Oops. So the the imagination zone in my mind is almost more of like a constant area. It's a constant place. Maybe it's where you have instead of the big trunk of messy, messy toys. Maybe you organize it a little bit more. Yours was so inspiring and simple. It was like one of those Ikea bins with removable trays, all with labels. And you were big on rotating. You were constantly rotating them out. Every time we came over, it was something different, but very simple. So one one tray may have been wooden blocks. One tray may have been little figurines. One tray may have been magnet tiles. And then the next week you'd rotate out something different. So it wasn't a lot. It wasn't overwhelming. And then the messy zone sounds like it's more of like an adaptable but contained space when you do it so perhaps it's on your kitchen table but it's on this tray it's this bin of play-doh that you take out and that you put away when you're done correct is that what i'm hearing exactly i mean and if you have the space in your home and you want to set up an art table uh, which even when i've lived in tiny apartments i've tried to kind of squish one in somewhere because we just use it so often that i didn't want it to be my dining room table i wanted a separate one but if you don't have the space for that or you don't want more furniture just use a tray right or the kitchen counter but the point is to kind of visit that zone every day even if it's a pop-up zone like you're saying is to visit every day and i really just love that you pointed out that we want it to be uh, minimalistic and clean. Rotation is a great idea to keep things fresh. Toys do go stale, kind of like houses on the market. Um, but um, but what's really important is that there's an appropriate amount, that cleanup is simple and quick, uh, that it's not overwhelming. More toys does not equal more play. Um, so really simple toys, uh, really simple objects, um, but kind of kept in a very clean and, and inviting way. And I think, you know, you could take ex- inspiration from children's museums or children's play spaces or playgrounds that you go to and just see how actually with very simple materials laid out in a very simple way children are drawn to it like a moth to a flame and and can really that it's their creativity is the spark of play it's not the toy right we don't need toys that play for them or entertain them or flashing lights or music it's really about just giving them the tools and they're there to create the world and breathe the life into it love it okay and So you kind of answered this, but so is each zone used every day? So, I mean, look, it depends what you're doing, right? If your kids are in school all day, then no. Um, But we've all experienced, whether it's sick days or quarantines or, you know, summer vacation or whatever it is, or just long afternoons, um, that would be a really good time to kind of cycle through weekends. So no, it doesn't have to, you know, there's no dogma here. But I think you kind of want to hit on all these developmental kind of areas for a well-rounded day right Mm -hmm. um with your kids so i'll I'll just quickly outline the other zones so you can see what i mean but you have imaginative play which is kind of that creativity and you have the messy zone which is also artistic expression and and sensory uh, exploration and then you have the quiet zone so the quiet zone is really a place where you have emotional regulation you snuggle up you read a book it's where you have maybe a tent or a bean bag or just your, your cuddlies and it's a place where if a child's having a tantrum you would want them to go there and calm down a place where maybe you read every night before bed and this really could be the child's bed that's fine but maybe it's also just an extra little area or nook or cranny often children really like that enveloped 
feeling like being under a tablecloth and hiding or being in some kind of niche in the home. They they often stuff themselves right into those little corners. And um, it's because that shell like feeling, that protective feeling is, is necessary sometimes. And really in our, in our culture, we don't put a lot of emphasis on rest. So I think the quiet zone is to remind us that downtime, you know, what we don't do, what we're not saying is just as important. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's the movement zone. And, you know, I our, love our kids, your movement zone. <laughs> our kids really aren't moving enough. They're just not. And and kids play outdoors so much less than they used to, which is tragic. And I really hope that rather than having a movement zone, our kids are just outside all the time in the forest. But given that we're sometimes home for long stretches, it's really important to cater to this need. You know, as adults, we have to motivate ourselves, go to the gym, work out, move your body, do yoga. But if you just look at a young kid for a few minutes, you'll notice how free and intuitive they are with their bodies. They'll lie down, they'll stretch, they'll jump around, they'll work themselves into a sweat, um, you know, spontaneously and just like intrinsically motivated, which is so cool. So you, if your kids are climbing the walls, I, I say, give them something to climb, right? My favorite is indoor swings. We love putting hooks up on our ceiling and rotating in and out different swings, especially when they swivel round and round. There's a lot that goes into this, just like the vestibular system and spine, you know, health and 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 balance. And I'm sure you could talk about that a lot more than me. But um, just being able to move, whether it's a balance beam and really just a mat, just putting out a, a yoga mat or a gym mat on the floor and allowing for it. So many of us are like, oh no, watch the corners. Don't break this, don't break that. But even if you can just put a pile of pillows together and let them at it, let them rough and tumble, let them move their bodies, that's gonna really help with their behavior, with their mood, with their sleep at night, with pretty much every aspect of their life. Mm -hmm. Um, Before I met you, people had talked to me about swings and I just couldn't picture how they would fit into a home that would still feel homey. And I loved it. Yours were smack in the middle of the family room. So you literally had a couch, this open area with like a little beanbag thing under it. And then like the mantle, obviously safely away, but it was very simple. And literally every time I came to your home, I mean, the kids would play in that area or in your imagination zone, we would sit at the table and just talk for like hours. And every time I came, it was, you had rotated the swing. So I think at the time you had probably two or three different ones. And it just, it worked. It worked so well. It didn't feel like it was taking over your house. It didn't feel like you were throwing all caution to the wind. Your kids get and got what they need and also were, you know, satisfied. Then they would come sit at the table with us, perfectly happy, just sitting there having a conversation. It really, I love that word use containers. Like it really, you had containers all throughout your house and your kids just felt, um, it's like they felt really safe and secure with whatever they needed, you know, they'd get up, they'd rest in the quiet, they'd come back. And I think we all need that, right? We all need that permission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's useful. And it wasn't a big space, right? It wasn't a big space. If this is something that you can do, even in a small space, you just make, you know, we, we gave up on a coffee table to make this uh, possible, right? So you have to, you have to be a bit creative, but I think it's worth it to have that kind of, you know, those, to to be able to answer their needs, basically. Um, And then the final one is the focus zone. And this is where you do anything that's got to do with schoolwork, with, you know, studying, with tech, uh, with science experiments, with things that need to be respected in terms of there's a right way and a wrong way. And this differentiates it from the imagination zone and the imagination zone. You can build with magnetiles and mix it with Lego and bring in the figurines and it's all good. But if you do a science experiment the wrong way or if you disrespect a puzzle, you break it. It doesn't work again. It, it You did it wrong. And so the focus zone really is a place to kind of pay homage to attention and to concentration and to the fact that there is an attention crisis in, in young people today. Um, it's not their fault, um, but there's a lot that we can do design-wise and parenting-wise to help actually respect and elongate their attention span and their ability to focus and it's not really fair on children to expect them to be able to focus when there's a tv in the corner you know when when people are walking in and out when there's a lot of distraction one thing we know about children and and really interesting studies show that if you if you show a child and an adult the a room uh, an adult will notice the focal point for example of the room like they will be able to read that one poster on the wall and remember it but they won't really remember all the other things in the room a child will have absorbed a lot more information But a lot of it is irrelevant information to the adult mind. 
And, and what this pointed to is the fact that children's focus kind of absorbs everything all at once. They find it actually much more hard to focus their attention on one specific source of information. And on the other hand, they're much better at taking all of the cues in. So we have much sharper selection. And that makes focusing, say, just on my computer right now, rather than looking everywhere else, easier for me. But a child, if you have exciting things going on, it's all coming at them at pretty much the same volume. And so we need to use design to point them at that focal point. And if you want your child to su succeed at homework or whatever it is that they're trying to, to study or do, the puzzle say, you need to set them up for success by clearing their periphery view and allowing them to focus on that, you know, elevating that one thing into their uh, into the realm of focus for them. And that's what the focus zone is supposed to offer them, this kind of quiet space to really work. Okay, so I'm picturing my kitchen table right now, which is where everyone goes to do their homework and everything at night. We, you know, probably like many, right? They've got after school activities. They come home from school. It's a mad rush to get dinner in them. And then they're using that same table, all three of them to do their homework. So what would you do in that situation? How would you create a focus zone there? So if it works, it works and it's fine. And I always think like whatever works for you, there is no, as I said, there is no dogma here. It's just ideas. But if, if a child is struggling, right? If they're struggling, if they're not advancing, if they can't focus, if they keep getting distracted, then I would actually put them in a separate room in that case. Like mm -hmm. I would set them up at mom or dad's desk or a desk in their own room or something with a door, right? It's very hard to focus on your homework when she's right over here focusing on her homework. It's just distracting. So some kids can do it, but most kids are going to have a, a lot sharper focus when the distractions are, are removed. Yeah. Okay. I, I definitely hear that. And then my first thought is, okay, but how do I help say Levi in one room while the other kids are in the other room? So you could rotate. And this is what I do is I, I, when it's happening simultaneously, mm -hmm. I rotate, right? Okay. So I'm like walking between them. They're working independently most of the time, but then I'm coming and, and I don't think this should happen for any length of time. Right. But it's like, if you have 15 minutes of work or whatever it is, then get that 15 minutes, you know, juice it for what it's worth and not be, frustrated and distracted mm -hmm. if it's something that they're happy all doing at the same time it's working that's fine but if they're hearing your instruction with this one and that's not allowing them to focus on that one then maybe even stagger it right like one at a time they come to you to your office the rest of them are playing drawing playing guitar whatever it is they're doing and they come one by one for a mini you know focus session with mom so that it's not fragmented does that make sense it yeah. does yeah and I can feel that that would feel more grounded to them and to me you know? yeah it's hard for you to be splitting your attention that way for, for sure. sure and I know right. so many can relate right so almost like a timer is just like okay 15 minutes with you then you leave mm -hmm. you call your brother he comes in then you leave you call your sister she comes in it just I think would release that pressure of everyone has to do it at once and everyone has to succeed and focus at once and we only have one you know adult helping really really gives you empathy to for teachers in a room right who are oh, trying God. to I can't even imagine <laughs> <laughs> doing this they need their zones Okay, yeah. so that's all five zones, right? That's all five zones. Yeah, okay. that's imagination, messy, quiet, focus, and movement. Amazing. Okay, uh, I want to pivot real quick because I know you have to go get your kids in a minute and you're such a wealth of information. I want to pull out a little bit more of your incredible tools. So in watching you, I literally feel like you're the CEO of your home in that you've created systems that work. You were one of the people in my life that helped me realize I could do both. I could do the things that I'm passionate about, call it career, call it hobbies, working out, whatever it is, the things that I want to do for me and be a really good conscious present parent for my children and a really good partner to my husband. And you've created systems. Do you know what I'm talking about here? Like just the thing, if I asked you, Avital, how do you, how do you do it all? You would say, mm -hmm. I don't, but these are the things I do that help me. So what are the things that help you? to be able to do it all. Mm. So I'm a big believer in help in the home. I actually currently don't have help in the home, but in general, I, you know, I'm like, whatever you can afford, get, you know, mm -hmm. however much help you could afford, you should get. I remember you telling me delegate what you can. So like, even if it's paying someone, a young person to come over after school and do your laundry, have them do your laundry. Like if there's something that you don't have to do that someone else can do and someone young can do that, like helps them make money and, you know, helps you not have a ton of overhead for it, do it because that me, and you leveraged it for me. You were like, by not doing your laundry, what can you do then? What can you do with your kids? What can you do with your partner? What can you do with yourself? 
So I was like, okay, laundry's done. Laundry's gone. It's off my list. That's amazing. So yeah, I absolutely do believe whatever you can delegate, especially, especially when it comes to career, because at least then, you know, you're going to be able to cover the cost of whatever it is that you're doing. That really helps you. Yeah. Um, it's harder for people to take that step when it's like, what, for me to go to the gym, I'm going to pay someone to do my laundry. Again, if you can afford it, do it. But, you know, I think people underestimate how much a little bit of help helps, right? Like a mother's helper, it has been one of the most amazing things for me. Young teenage girls who are, you know, they work for for very little money is a, is a big deal to them. They're excited for their first job. Um, I'm in the home. I'm working in the next room if there's an emergency or, or even if they just need to know where whatever, where the pasta is, I can help them. But they are happy and energetic to read my kid's book, to roughhouse with them, to even to go to the playground, whatever it is. So I think finding those kind of people who can help. One of my clients once put a sign up in her, building she she suddenly realized after we spoke about this need for village and for support she's like I live in a building full of senior citizens I'm gonna put up a sign and she put up a sign for a volunteer grandparent um she was like I'm just looking for someone to read some books to my kids it might be a wonderful thing for this person even with no money at all often people are just looking for that type of human connection they would love to help you um so so really it's like opening yourself up to receiving and 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 to allowing other people to, to to care for your children without being too neurotic about it that's one of the steps there I'm also a really big fan of planning I think our family is the biggest project of our life right it's just the most profound and meaningful project of our life and we all kind of have this sense I think that when we look back on our deathbed it's not going to be how much money we made or how fit we were or whatever but it's really going to be about these relationships and these connections were they meaningful you know were we there were we present um and when you start to look at it like a project, you can really start to borrow the tools of project management, setting goals, understanding what your mission is, what your values are, um, and how you want to go about kind of checking off those lists. And it sounds very kind of masculine and orderly and 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 almost cold, but those are really useful tools. They're really useful tools to start thinking, well, you know, what do I want to experience on a regular basis? You know, one of my one of my big ones is sitting around the table as a family for dinner. It's a tool, right, that can help you to express your goals and your family values and what you're working towards. It can help you make sure that you have that connection time with your family. You have a time for deep conversation. You have a time to touch base with family members and understand to convey your values, table manners, eating ha- healthy patterns, etc. All of those things can happen around the dinner table. But You know, I don't know, Mel, I don't think it's something we can take for granted. It takes quite a lot of work to make it happen that the family sits around the table for dinner, right? There's a lot of time management that goes into that. There's a lot of psychology. There's a lot of handling different people's needs and schedules and food preferences and circadian circadian rhythms and all of that, right? It, It takes planning. It doesn't just happen. So I think for me, when you say CEO of your family, what that conjures up for me is someone who's a visionary not in you know not in a cliched sense but literally crafting a vision where are we going with all of this because there are so many valid ways of having a family there are so many different types of family structure family values family goals family cultures really Mm -hmm. but you can only do one your family only really gets to be your family and your culture right and these relationships and these experiences and sometimes I quantify it in my head and I'm like look I've got about 18 years with each child in the house right that's 18 summers you know this and this amount of dinners this and this amount of extra this set of skills that I'll manage to teach each of them like if I oh I want them to learn to swim and to ride a bike and to read Hebrew and to all you know I have all these skills isn't it you know we've got to get organized with kind of meeting these goals and that takes a certain amount of planning. And 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 I think, you know, one of the things that I've loved thinking about is how CEOs get these um, offsites, right? Mm-hmm. They, they do these offsites with their teams. They brainstorm, okay, what's our mission? What are our values? What's our branding? What's our logo? What do we stand for? What are our top three goals this quarter? Mm-hmm. How will we know if we've met these goals? These are the types of questions they're asking. And yet here we are running a far more important project, potentially, arguably, right? Or at mm-hmm. least a lot more emotionally meaningful. And we're not really thinking about it. We're, we're winging it. And so true. So true. So many people that doesn't feel good, right? It doesn't feel good to wing it because when we wing it, it's hit and miss. We're not really sure. Are we on the path? Have we made these choices? Is it even a conscious decision to begin with? Um, and so I think that's where I go in my head when you say kind of systems, you know? Yeah. So do you do that for your family? Do you guys 
think about what's our mission. What's our, what are our goals? What do we want to do this year? Like do you, your branding, your logo, you know, not exactly those things, but do you create your vision for what you want your family to look like for the year for the, or how do you chunk it down so that you get the daily planning in? Yeah, I absolutely do. So I really, you know, I think CEOs really think about this in terms of, let's say quarterly, yearly, five-year, 10-year goals. And I like to think about it in those terms as well. So what are the few things that I'm focusing on this quarter? Like, and they they could be really practical, like the idea of sitting around the table for dinner five times a week, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, getting out in nature once a week, Um, each of us maintaining our health goals and that kind of thing. You know, we we could drill down into personal goals, et et cetera. But between me and my children, I'll be like, okay, I want to be present at bedtime. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to read at least one book before bedtime. I want to teach this one to read this quarter. That's my focus. With this one, I'm working on emotional regulation, right? That type of thing. So I just have a few and you can't have too many because that gets lost. Mm -hmm. But if you think like, this is what we're working on. But then there are some things I think about in a longer term, like, you know, over the course of the next 10 years, I want to have several meaningful family, you know, travel experiences. Okay, what kind of countries do we want to go to? Why? What are we going to learn from that? What type of experience? You know, this is really a branding question. When you plan a family vacation, you're branding your family, right? Are you the type of people who stay in five-star hotels or do you go camping, right? Do you go to Disney World or do you go hiking? These are very different value calls, Right. And I'm not making judgments what's better, but mm-hmm. they're calls on what type of family we are and what type of people we are and what type of culture we're, we are promoting within our family. So you want to make those calls somewhat intentionally, right? Somewhat like, hey, is this the type of family we want to be? Is this the model, the role model we want to give our children? Um, and then I think you also want to think just generally speaking, like, hey, if you have this value or this goal of being, say, a very open, warm home, right? I have that goal but it's really not so easy for me, right? It, it it demands certain things, a certain prep, certain level of cleanliness that I'm only comfortable if people come in, you know, in my home if it's certain level or me managing my anxiety around it not being that clean. You know, there's certain things that go into that. That's something that, again, it takes intentionality. So yes, I do. I think about those things and I discuss them often with my partner and we kind of have this ongoing conversation about what are the goals. And I think when you start to get clear on values, one thing that comes through for me is that values come at the expense of each other. You can't have them all. You have to choose. And every choice has a cost and it has a benefit. Like every choice, every choice that we make for our kids, right? Am I homeschooling? Am I not? Am I cloth diapering? Am I not? Are we vegan? Are we carnivores? Etc. All of these have pros and cons. And the worst place to be is in limbo. The worst place to be is, I don't know, I don't know, I don't, you know, we're, we're lost. Our children need that leadership. And so do we, we need clarity, we need direction. And there are lots of good directions. But again, like choice paralysis a little bit, but we have to choose. So those are the types of conversations I really encourage myself and parents around me to to think through is each of these decisions is an opportunity. It's an amazing opportunity. It's an exciting opportunity to build that curriculum for our children, to be that blueprint of what it means to live a good life, what it means to be good people. Like we're all trying to figure that out as we go along, each decision by decision, right? But I think it's those meta conversations and those larger picture that help us to delay the gratification. Like just the screens is such a great example. It's like, it's so tempting and easy to just do hours a day. Um, and that that's fine. Like that's legitimate. It's a perfectly legitimate choice, except that if you have certain long-term goals, you have to think about what the decisions in the day-to-day life are pointing towards, right? What will that render in a 16 year old or a 21 year old um, in the long run? And it takes a certain level of sacrifice today in order to orient our family in the direction that we're trying to get them to go. You're so good at, you know, witnessing you and your husband have these conversations and plan long-term. And I know you have a lot of resources for that. And I definitely want to share those. I'll put them in the show notes because taking that time and setting that, you know, North star or compass Mm -hmm. for the future, what do we want it to look like? Who do we want to be as a family when we get to the, you know, we have them for 18 years, really, we only have them for 18 years. And so at the end of that time, what do we want the product to be? That sounds kind of funny when we're talking about a kid, but I know we all understand. 
Yeah. And once you set that and you get clear on that, either with yourself or especially with your partner, if you have your partner, it makes the day-to-day decision-making so much easier. Don't you find, do we do this or do we do this? Well, we obviously do this because it takes us closer as this one takes us further away and we committed, this is what we want. So you don't get stuck in that. I call it paralysis analysis or decision yeah. paralysis. Right. Um, exactly. And I've watched you guys do that. You know, I've been in your home. I've watched you. I've witnessed it with your five children. We had the pleasure of being with you guys, our two families together, our three, we had three amazing families together in Costa Rica a couple summers ago, I loved that time. And I loved watching how you guys navigate the values that I know you've established as a family. It, it's like a rhythm between the two of you with five kids who at the time, what was the age span of your kids? The age span is about 10 years. Yeah. Okay. So your Gunga, so the baby, when we were on the trip was, was six, six months, I think. Yeah. Six months old. Okay. So we had six months all the way through a 10 year old. And I mean, you guys literally make it look so seamless, but it's because you've had those. I know you don't think that. Of course, there's there's tantrums, there's breakdowns, there's struggles, there's frustrations, but you can tell that you've had the conversation on the values. You guys mm. have gotten on the same page. And I know that hasn't always been easy because you didn't always start on the same page. I know that you're very open about sharing that, but you've sat down and you've done the work and you've had those conversations and it makes those day-to-day tantrum struggles more easy to navigate because you're a team. Mm -hmm. And I thank you for sharing that. And I think that's such a huge tool for so many people. Um, And so I definitely want people to be able to have access to your platforms, your courses, your resources, and you. So thank you for sharing all this incredible information with us, Avital. I'm so blessed to have you in my life. Mel, you're such a superstar, absolutely gorgeous inside and out. And I miss you very much. And thank you for spending this time with me. And I'm really honored that whenever I need a bit of an ego boost, I know where to go. (laughs) (laughs) I love you. Thank you. Wow, that was great. I always get so much out of my time with Avital. I really encourage you all to really take a listen at those zones, even if you need to listen to this podcast again and again and recreate them in your home in whatever way works best for you, it will literally change the way that your home feels and functions for your family. If you liked this podcast, make sure to hit the like button. Be sure you subscribe so that you don't miss any upcoming episodes. And also most importantly, share it with a friend who needs this information. Thank you so much. Like that's, that might sound, wow, it's really loud. Did you hear that? Uh That's great. Yeah. (laughs) Um, that might I thought sound- that was your stomach growling. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really hungry. The whole world can hear it. It's so loud. Wow. Mm-hmm. It's our first rain. It's very exciting. Once, oh my God. Okay, there's a window here. I will close it because it's so loud.